Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Thanks guys. Thank you. That really helps. That really does. But I wanted to show this video, not only because of how touching it is, um, that's actually a movie, and I love that scene, where it talks about the love of God and how our method is love. So if you can put up my first scripture, please. It says in Romans 1, 3 through 6, for the gospel is all about God's son. And as a man, he descended from David's royal lineage, but as the mighty son of God, he was raised from the dead and miraculously set apart with the display of triumphant power supplied by the spirit of holiness. And now Jesus is our Lord and our Messiah. You need to put up the next one. That one's fine. So I love how it says here, for the gospel is all about God's son. Okay? For the gospel. And then the first part that he says is that uh, we have been miraculously set apart, displayed with triumph. Yes. So when we're going and if we think about the gospel, the one thing we can think of is God's grace. Correct? We think of God's grace. And in the Bible it says that God gives us his cascaded grace cascaded i love when the bible uses like nice words like that because then it means like it's something legit so it's cascaded grace does anyone know what cascaded means i didn't so i had to look it up like it sounded good i was like cascaded grace like yeah i got cascaded grace you don't like no but i looked it up and cascaded means like for water but for this instance god's grace and it's pretty much grace being poured down rapidly you know, and the funny thing is, is, like, God used to cascade it, pour down rapidly. So, like, as quick as God gives us his grace is as quick as we mess up, you know. And to think about it, like, you know, people, like, to the right or to the left of you that really need some cascaded grace. Like, you know, hey, you definitely need some cascaded all the time pouring down on you. But if you think about it, it's cool. It's beautiful. So what does that mean, cascaded grace? That means when you and I mess up, when we make mistakes, God's there to redeem us. He, he doesn't remind us of it anymore. So whenever you've messed up, you don't need to feel the guilt. You don't need to feel the shame. You don't need to feel everything that comes with messing up. It's like a clean slate every time. And that's the beautiful part, right? And then can we go to the next point? Yes. Through him, a joy producing grace cascaded, yeah, like I said, into us, empowering us with the gift of apostleship so that we can win people from every nation into a faithful commitment to Jesus to bring honor to his name. And you are among the chosen ones who receive the call to belong to Jesus, the anointed one. Right? It's, it's like the hoorah scripture. Like, yeah, we're meant to go preach the gospel. Right? So it's like, if you think about it, we got the grace part and then we're all the apostles. We've all been called. We've all been sent out, right? Dead crowd. We've all been sent out. I've been, I've been sent out. That's my job, right? So who's ready to go out and tell people about God, right? Woo! Yeah, right? Okay, I'm about to blow you away, though. So it says here, right, like we were sent out. So it's like God has enlisted us, right, into God's army, right? We've all been deployed. We all have a war zone to go out to, and that's outside of this church, but, but here's, here's the funny part, right, that, that the scripture doesn't talk about. Paul, Paul didn't know this, but did you know that 95% of all Christians have never won a single soul to Christ? Did you know that 80% of all Christians do not consistently win witness for, for Christ? And then less than 2% are involved in the ministry of evangelism. And you know how Benny was talking about, you know, tithing into the kingdom? This one's going to hurt. 71% do not give toward the financing of the Great Commission. That's deep, right? Like 95% of everybody in here doesn't talk about God. Let that settle in. Right? So, so when, when Paul was saying this, though, they were hunting down Christians. Right? He, he was going to be killed for this. If he, later on, he died for the gospel. Yet he was commissioned. And, and us, is, is, are people hunting us down? No? Is someone like the boogeyman Christian dude going, no. Like, when every time you bring up Jesus, like, no. I mean, it happens in little ways. Like, I had a Bible club at school, and they tried shutting me down a couple times because they said I forced kids in there. 
Uh, what did I, like, hold the door? No, no, Jesus, Jesus. Like, no, I didn't do that. I, I offered free pizza. Come on, free pizza. And you're going to put the, I locked them all in there. Like, no, that, that, that's as bad as we got it. Like, people are like, no, can we be sensitive? You know, like how he said in the video, you know, being politically correct, people get offended, triggered by Jesus. You know what I mean? So we don't have it that bad. We don't if we think about it. But, but they did. And, and think about this. Not only that, but you know who said that, right? Paul, right? You know what he used to do? His prior job? Does anybody know that? He used to hunt down Christians. Yeah, that's the same guy, right? So he got radically changed by God, and then he's talking about the Great Commission, right? This dude was like Saul the bounty hunter, but he would like come and kill you, like, like for real. And the thing is, what challenged me the most was like, we all know, yeah, like he was, he was going, he met Jesus, he got blind. Oh, so beautiful. He's, he comes back, and he talks, talks to the whole world about God. But the part that we don't ever think about is this. Put yourself in, this, in those shoes back then. If I were alive back then, and before Paul knew God, when he was Saul, would he have hunted me down? Would he have known that I'm a Christian? Would he have known that you're a Christian? Or could he not tell the difference? Could he? I asked myself that. I fell short of that. I was like, I was like crap. Well, he probably wouldn't at all the time. Not all the time. I'd probably look like any other bystander walking past him while he's on his way to go kill Christians. Yet, yet at church, like, we're all like, yes, the army of God. Like, we all love worship. Like, I love how everybody's like, yeah. Like, I see people going, ah. You know, like, and, uh, poor, poor La Carlos. Like, I was singing, like, really loud. I could, I, I could only imagine how bad his ears are right now. But, like, you know, we're all going in like, yeah, Jesus. And, like, we're all soldiers for Christ, right? We're all soldiers when we walk in. We all put on the uniform. Yes. Yeah, holy, yes, thank you, God. You know, like, like we're, we're, all, we're all excited, and then right when we walk out, it's like we all AWOL on Jesus. Like, we all like, yeah, put, put on the center patch back again. Like, it's like we clock in and out with God. Like, we're, clock, we're clocking in and out, right? Don't, don't lie to me. Y'all. Yeah, yeah, that's my neighbor. No, it's you. No, trust me. It's me, too. No, trust me. Because, like, sometimes I can catch myself, like, man, do people know that I'm safe? Like, when I'm walking past, like, one time, it was really bad, you know, because my dad's the pastor and all that, so I was in high school, right? And I told him all, like, hey, you should, you should come to my youth group. It's great. My friend's like, dude, you're Christian? And, like, I had known him for, like, three years. I was like, oh. Like, that, that one really hurt me. That, that was, like, two years ago, though, okay? All right? All right? It's probably last week. No. But, no, but that, that happens. Like, he was like, dude, like, you're a Christian? And that was like, ah, oh, it, it got me really bad, but... Like, somebody doesn't need to say that for me to really believe it. If you think about it a lot, do you really resemble what it means to be Christian? I don't know. You tell me. But Paul's telling that to us. It sounds great. So how, how do we get the 95% of us to wake up? How do we get me? I'm in the 95% sometimes. I trickle back and forth. Um, but how do we motivate us to, to, to start to begin to show people God's love, Right? How do, how do we do that? Because if you don't have a why, you're never going to do anything, right? Like when telemarketers call, that must be the worst job. Like I, I would feel, I'd hate the rejection of always getting hanged up on. Like I would really not like that. But when they call, like most of us are like, right, right when they say, hey, is this Isaac Ruiz? Oh, can I take a moment here? I, I like hang up, you know? <laughs> but like, <laughs> so like, but I don't know the why yet. Like I wish they could like send me a text first. Like, hey, we're about to call you. This is what we're going to talk about. Press one if you don't want this. Like, I'd, I'd press no all the time. Like, one, 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 one. But, like, if we don't know the why, I'm not going to answer their call. Like, and what my dad always says, like, when people call him, oh, like, and he doesn't know the number, he's like, uh, they'll leave me a message if it's important. You know, so if he doesn't know the why, he's not going to, yep, talk to me. Like, we're, we're not going to do that, right? So how do we motivate ourselves? Let me tell you a story. Can I tell you guys a funny story? Yeah. All the stories I tell about myself, it was either when I made a mistake, I messed up, and... That usually works for me up here. So <laughs> let me tell you this. So has anyone ever heard of academic decathlon? It's pretty much school times two plus hell for me. So like I needed an extra credit. Like, like I needed credit. So I was like, shoot, like I'm not about to do like theater. I don't feel like I'm meant for that. So I was like, I'll do academic decathlon. All my friends told me, man, it's easy, bro. You just show up. And I was like, really? And then I sign up, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, your school starts at, you know, like 8.30 for you. But since you're in academic decathlon, you got to come at like 7 a.m. And I was like, oh, crap, 
right? So I get there. I'm like, it's okay. I just need to show up, right? I go there. They, hand, they start handing me packets first day. Like, like when you think packets, you're thinking like three. I got a whole stack, okay? And I didn't even know what academic decathlon was. So it's pretty much studying history, science, literature, art, um, like, but like ancient art, and like knowing what the themes were and all that. Like, and then the speech and debate. I love speech and debate. I like talking. So like, I was like, my hoorah, but then I was like destroyed by all that. So it sucks. It's like school times two in the morning. Like I get to do an hour of this. And like, if you're not reading, like she liked to be called coach. And even though she was a teacher, she's like, call me coach. Like, and like whenever I'd like not be reading, I'd be like dozing off. She'd be like, hey, hey read, read, read. And like, <laughs> she'd get up. So I was like, okay. So we have a competition. All right, we're going to compete against other schools. So it's like Battle of the Nerds, all right? <laughs> Battle the... So if you're in it, forgive me. I hated it, but it's okay if you love it. I respect you, because that's a lot of smart people. So we're going, right? So I'm supposed to wake up at 4 a.m. I have to meet at my friend's house by 5 a.m. And school's like an hour and a half away that I have to go compete at, right? So I set my alarm, right? I'm like, I'm going to wake up. So I go to sleep. I wake up, and I was like, why do I feel like refreshed? I was like... <laughs> why is there sun in my room? Like, and then I was like, no. I grabbed my phone. I have 20 missed calls from coach and also my other teammates, and I have missed it, and it's 7 in the morning, right? And then I call my teacher. I'm trying to, like, get out of it, right? Because I was like, hey, um, yeah, I just woke up. She's like, Isaac Ruiz, you need to get over here now. I was like, well, um, my 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 dad's asleep. And then she's like, well, I need to talk to either one of your parents, your mom or your dad. And my mom was out of town. And I don't know if any of you know my dad. Like, that's not the hottest choice for me. <laughs> like, um, especially, like, because he has high standards. It's like being on time is, like, very key. So I, I was like, shoot. And then she, I was like, he's sleeping. You know, I give an excuse. It's like, he's actually sleeping, so I can't wake him up. And then she's like, Isaac, if you don't wake him up right now, I'm going to fail you, and you're not going to get your credit. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I was like, give me a second. I'm like praying to God, God, give me mercy, right? And I open the, his door, and he's, he's a heavy sleeper, so I'm like, I'm giving myself like five seconds, like looking like, <sighs> like I'm ready, right? And, I, and I'm like, Dad. And he, like, right when he opened his eyes, he saw the expression on my face and saw the light in the room. So I'm like, and then he's like, like, he already got, he already knew. Like, it was like that moment he opened his eyes, we had the connection of your son just messed up, right? So then he talks to my coach, right? And then, like, all I can hear him, he's going, and then he's mouthing to me, get dressed. And I was like, I ran, I got dressed. He got me there in, like, 30 minutes. I don't know how he did it, some pastoral powers, all right? But I got there quick. So what's the moral to that story? Nothing. No, I'm just kidding. No. But he, here's, here's, here's the cool parts of the story. Number one, I gave excuses. Okay, right? I gave excuses because I didn't have a, really a reason. Like, it wasn't like, oh, my God, I can't wait. Academic decathlon. I'm like, no, I didn't have my why. So I, I just snoozed that alarm, and I was like, oh, okay, back to sleep. Right? So number one, I gave excuses. How many of us give ourselves excuses for going out and talking to people about God? How many of us? Raise your hand. You better. Someone doesn't raise their hand. I want to talk to you after. Please teach me what you're doing. Okay. Number two, my father, right? <laughs> yeah, Pastor Maurice, yeah. Yeah. So imagine if that was your job to wake him up. You'd know. Okay. But I had to wake him up, right? So I, he's my father. Is he going to be like, no, I banished you? Like, no, he's not. He loves me, right? I mean, yeah, he got upset. And then after he spelled my name on my butt with the belt, then he accepted me back. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. That didn't happen. No, but he loves me. So he, of course he took me. He's going to take you where you need to go. Just like the father, just like God. He's going to take you where you need to go, no matter if you like it or not. But he loves you, so he's going to take you. And my dad was supportive the whole way. Yeah, he was kind of quiet the whole way. You know, like I had to wake him up and all that. But he was supportive. And I did good that day. I actually didn't do that bad that bad. Uh, but I, I did solid. So he cared for me. He loved me just like, just like Jesus would. And, and he took me there. And the thing is, is like telling others about God, like if you don't have your why, you're never going to do it. So how do you get your why? How? I know that people are like, accept God's love. And then you're like, yeah, how? You know? And, and this is how I did it. Okay. I think this is like the most generic way other people do it. Has anyone ever made mistakes here? Has anyone ever messed up bad? Like really bad. So 
So like, you know, it's, it's cool to have like your dad as a pastor, but it's not cool when your dad uses you as like, like sermon stuff, but like for all the bad things your kids have done. <laughs> Like, I'm that one, and Alexis is like, yeah, my daughter's a worship leader. Yeah, you know, she's great. You know, Isaac, you know, today we're going to talk about sin, you know? Like, like, <laughs> it's like the biggest segue. But the thing is, is like, that's how I felt sometimes, not because of him, but because of me. I was just like, man, like, I felt disgusting. Like, I felt like I was lost. And I went up to God one day, and I was like, God, like, it was the altar. I was like, God, please, I was like, forgive me. I felt disgusted by my sin. I was like, I just could kept being reminded of it, and it was annoying. It's like depression. Imagine being reminded of all of the things that you've ever done. And you're like, yeah, Isaac, you're only 19. What could you have done? Trust me. If you know, like, you wouldn't like me up here. But God has grace, right? And I've been changed. But, I mean, imagine if your sins were showed too, so don't put me on that pedestal, all right? <laughs> but I was like, God, I'm, like, disgusted with myself, please. And at that moment, not like that exact moment, but I was in a worship service, and I was like, God, please. And it's like, I saw all my sins again. I saw everything that bothered me, but I couldn't help but feel love. And I was like, what the heck? Like, you, like the way I talk to God is, like, weird. I'm like, what? Like, in the expressions on my face, like, like, you, like imagine just looking in my corner of the room doing worship, like. <laughs> you know? But I was like, I feel love, and I feel, like, acceptance. And I was like, this is weird. Like, who, who would do that? And it's but God. And that's Jesus' love for you. And then that's my why of why I'm up here. What's your why? And it doesn't matter what pain you're going through. You could, you could be going through a lot of heart turmoil, a lot of trauma. You could, you could feel like you're not good enough, inadequate. You feel like there's no reason for me to do this. Like, I've messed up too much. I'm too far gone. That doesn't exist with God. His love casts out all fear. And the thing is, is like, we can be so caught up in the, the do's and don'ts and the have-nots and the what I haven't done and, oh, he's this far off with God. Like, I'm here. He's there. Let's not compare at all. We, we got to let go of that. And the thing is, is that's going to hold us back the most is when we feel like we aren't good enough. Like, we, we haven't made it. And let me tell you this. No one's arrived. No one has. My dad hasn't. My mom hasn't. Alexis hasn't. I definitely haven't. Um, no one arrives. But the thing is, God's grace is so beautiful for us. Amen. And once you know God's love, it changes you completely. So can we go to my scripture, Romans 2.29? So imagine it, where it says Jewish, imagine it says Christian, because I'm not Jewish. So it says, but you are Christian because of the inward act of spiritual circumcision, a radical change that lays bare your heart. It's not by the principle of the law, but by the power of the Holy Spirit. For then, your praise will not come from people, but from God himself. I love that, a radical change that lays bare your heart. I'm like, ah. When I was reading that earlier, I was like, dang. I was like, God's like moving on me right there. And I'm trying to write a message. And I was like, dang, like radical change. Like, legit, I did that in my room. I was like, I was, like, I was having my own worship service. And like, my poor dogs are looking at me like, <laughs> I'm like, ah. They're like barking too. Like, they're in it too. Ah. Like, they were all with it, with, with me. You know, but once you've like, you know those people who have fallen in love and also the people who've really fallen in love? You know, like, when you've fallen in love, like, here's the fake love. Let me give you a story. All right? When I was a kid, like, I really liked this girl, right? And I told everybody, I was like, hey, guys, like, this is my moment. Don't say, uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> She ain't here with me, so she don't get it, huh? So, <laughs> so I, I liked this girl, right? And I told all my friends, I'm like, this is the time, man. This is where I'm going to get her, right? So my friends are like, they do this behind my back. They're like, all right, we're going to help them out. So they tell the girl, right? And we're at, like, this camp, like, at school, you know, like, you know what I mean? So, like, it was, like, a perfect time for me, but they were like, hey, they told her during our dinner, right? Hey, Isaac likes you, right? And I didn't know this, so I'm, like, eating good food, like, rubbing, right? She comes up to me, and I'm like, and then she's like, hey, I heard you like me. And she's like, is it true? And then I was like, no, no, no. no. I don't know who told you that, but it ain't true. And then she was like, okay, like, and then walked off. And then my best friend at the time was like, okay, that's my cue. He takes her, right? So, yeah, we're not friends no more. Um, so that's the fake love, right? But then here's another one I have of a, of a better one. So imagine me. I'm, I'm, I'm vacuuming, 
right? And the girl, like I told, I was like, all right, I'm going to go vacuum here. I'm going to go volunteer here so I can see her. So I'm vacuuming, right? And I see her and I'm like, <laughs> vacuuming, right? <laughs> right? And then I hit a door. <laughs> I hit a door. And like, <laughs> it was like the most stupidest thing I've ever done. Like, Doosh. And the, it was double doors. So I fell through the door with the vacuum. The vacuum's still going. It's like I'm on the floor, like, all you see is like, like, like you know what I mean? So I'm like, I looked stupid, right? But I really liked this girl, so I just blew it off. I was like, now she knows I really like her. No, because I, I was stupid for her. I was like, I blew it off. I was like, I'm, like, I'm handsome now. I, I'll walk it off. I'll walk it off, you know? <laughs> But like, when you've met real love, you'll do anything. It doesn't matter. You'll look stupid. You'll, you'll do whatever it takes just to be with that person. And that's what God wants with you. He wants to show you that love so you can show others. You're willing to do anything. No, no one can hold you back. You're going, right? Just like me with the vacuum, right? When, when you've seen God's love, God's love takes you not where you would go naturally, like, naturally, without God, I wouldn't be up here. I'd be like, heck no. I'd be sitting down there and be like, loser, you know. Whoever's speaking, like, I wouldn't really care. But I've met God. So what you would do naturally, you're not going to do. But when you meet God's love, he's going to send you where you need to go spiritually, not where you want to go. It's not like Jesus is like, hey, do you want to go talk to him? I'm like, no. He's like, hey, go talk to him. Like, he doesn't, I don't know if he gives you options and, like, tells you, like, I'd rather have that relationship. But God's like, go. I'm like, oh, God, dang it. Right, and I go for it. Sometimes I miss it. It's okay, but someone will pick up the slack. But imagine all of us in here, all together loving people. Shoot, we changed the world. Shoot. Imagine this. Imagine all this congregation right here going like at least weekly to go speak to somebody. Wouldn't the city change? Wouldn't our schools change? That's what I did in my school. I started a club. I had 80 people every week. I was the biggest club on campus, right? And I was talking about Jesus. Right? And people are like, dude, the, car, the, the thing's whack. And I'd be like, all right, come. Like, tell me if it's whack. We got pizza. Who else is giving free pizza? And then they'd be like, all right. You know? And then they'd, they'd, they'd love it. I got Buddhists to come in my club. And they would give their life to Jesus. Gays, lesbians, they came to my club. I had the LGBTQ you know, club. And I invited them. And they thought I was the most stupidest person in the world. I was like, hey, you should, guys should come through. Like, we should like, do something. And they were like... Like, they, they gave me the look. I was like, isn't this, like, usually vice versa? I'm like, man. And, but they came, and they loved it. Not all of them got their lives changed, but shoot, I got the message across that love was, was our message. And what's your message? And if you're struggling today and you want to experience that love, God has this opportunity for you. And let me give you my last scripture. You guys put it up. It says in Romans 1.14, love obligates me. To preach to everyone, to those who are among the elite and to those who are among the outcasts, to those who are wise and educated as well as to those who are foolish and unlearned. Love obligates me. Does love obligate you? It, it gives me no option. At this time when Paul's writing this in Rome, it's the worst that it's ever been. Did you know at this time that the, the, the emperor Nero mounted up Christians alive and burned them on the street? to light up the, the whole city? Did you know that? Yet he was, he was obligated. Obligated. It obligated. It didn't matter to him how bad it was. It didn't matter to him what the opposition would be. He was obligated by what God had done for him, a, a man who used to kill Christians before. Will love obligate you? Will it? I know we don't have a radical story like that. But you know what? There's someone who did. There was a man in India in about older centuries ago. And they were just starting to get missionaries in India. And this man, he met Jesus. And he actually wrote a hymn. I don't know if you've all heard it. It's called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. Not a lot of people know the story behind it. So this man had just met Jesus through a missionary and he left his town. Everybody else stuck to their religion. He was like, him and his family said, we're going to be Christians. So he wrote a hymn, and it's wrote, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. Um, so he wrote it, right, and he would sing that to God. And the village chief, he hated it. He hated him for it. He was like, 
he's like, he's going against our tradition. So one night, he gathers all the people and goes to that man's house and pulls out his whole family. And he's intending to kill them. And he puts the man there who wrote that song and grabs his two daughters and they put a knife to their throat. And he says, if you reject your God, your kids will live. And all he could sing was, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. And they killed them right in front of him. Then they grabbed his wife and they said, if you do not turn, we're gonna kill your wife as well. So this is your moment. We've already killed your children, give up. And all he could sing was his song and he said, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. They killed his wife. Then it was him, and the chief was angry. He was like, give up. I killed all of your family. Enough. Just turn. You can always have another family again. Live. All I could say was, again, the cross before me, the world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. And those would end up being his last words. The village chief was so disturbed by this, of how he killed him and murdered him, that he, he was bothered and, and he couldn't believe it. He's like, how could this man die for this? And he's like, you know what? I need to know this Jesus. So he gives his life to God, right? But he doesn't only do that. He gathers all the people again into the same square where they killed that family. And he told them to all convert to Jesus. And they all converted that day. They all became followers of Jesus because love obligated him. And that man, showed that his love obligated him to show in his last words that Jesus was the only thing he could see regardless of his family being killed in front of him that he would see his family again and it obligated him to change and it took his death he didn't have to preach a sermon yes his passing it's tragic it's sorry but just one little act of love or one big act of love can change many people's hearts and lives so will you change your heart today Will you accept God's love? Will you challenge yourself? I dare you. Challenge yourself. Accept this love. Make a commitment. Don't be the 95%. Be the 5% that do something about it. Why, why wouldn't you? If you had a cure to a disease, would you hold it back from people because you're too nervous to tell them? Would you? But we let people go walk, walk by us all the time let, knowing that there's a heaven and there's a hell and we're okay with it. It's the same thing. I can't cure diseases. I can't just go around doing that. But I, but I have a father who, who can do things that I can. And what will you do? Will you make a decision today? Will you? If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.